Um, so uh, this talk is going to be about um, subconcussive impacts. Um, these are my disclosures. So we've heard a lot about concussion. There was a recent movie on this. And there's a lot of uh, press about concussion. Um, and uh, just uh, so we have some ground rules here. So concussion is a term used to summarize sort of the set of signs and symptoms uh, following force to the head or body resulting in brain movement. Now, subconcussive head impacts are the impacts of the head not resulting in a clinically diagnosed concussion. Subconcussive impacts are repetitive and typically the result of regular athletic play. Some of the typical symptoms of uh, concussion are, are listed below there. There we go. Uh, and a little bit on CTE. We've heard a lot about this already. So CTE is a progressive degenerative disease of the brain found in athletes and others with a history of repetitive brain trauma, including symptomatic concussion as well as asymptomatic subconcussive hits to the head. And the pathology, as we heard, is deposition of hyperphosphorylated tau in the depths of the sulci, which is uh, different in terms of the location from neurodegenerative diseases. Now, interestingly, uh, all CTE have a history of repetitive brain trauma, which includes both concussive and subconcussive injuries, but not all persons with rep repetitive brain trauma have CTE, and it's been shown that concussion is not the determinant for CTE. So this sort of raises the co uh, question if subconcussive impacts or this history of subconcussive impacts have uh, implications for development of CTE. So are subconcussive impacts a problem, and can imaging provide any evidence? And that's the topic of this talk. So we'll be looking at diffusion imaging, functional MRI, as well as uh, magnetoencephalography. So this was a study back in 2016 where they looked at head impacts and cognitive function. This is in 282 high school contact and non-contact players. They did cognitive testing using an impact test, which is commonly used on the field. Uh, they found that their contact players had poor performance in processing speed and in reaction time than the non-contact players. This is uh, another study from 2016. This is looking at head impacts and depression and CTE risk. This is in 93 former high school and college athletes. And for their uh, index of exposure, they use something called the cumulative head impact index. So this is a retrospective index based on questionnaires on what they assess to be what, how, how much impact exposure these athletes have experienced. And what they found was an interesting dose-response relationship between this cumulative head impact index and a variety of cognitive findings, including cognitive impairment, executive dis uh, dysfunction, depression, apathy, and behavioral dysregulation. An imp interesting aspect of this, it looked like there was a certain baseline risk, and you had to go get past a certain threshold before there was this dose-response was observed. And this is from that same paper here where they're looking at uh, abnormalities in uh, executive function and here for depression, and you can see that there's this sort of a dose response to cumulative head impact index in these players. This is another study. This is from 2015, Ramans et al., and they uh, looked at 22 players. These are in the youth population, 11 to 13 years old, and they used a system called the HITS. It's one that we use where there's uh, sensors embedded within the helmets so they can record all the impacts that the players receive. And they looked at balance, oculomotor performance, reaction time, self-reported symptoms using impact, and uh, another test known as King Devic, which sort of looks at eye movements. Um, and uh, the impact forces here they found were similar in magnitude and location to high school and collegiate athletes. So that's interesting. This is at the youth level. They're experiencing impacts similar to, the, to their older counterparts, even at the collegiate level. But they did find that the total impact frequency was lower. And this study is one of the negative studies where they didn't see an association with neurologic function and cumulative head impact uh, exposure. It's another study by Alasco et al. This is from 2017, where they looked at 96 former NFL players and 25 controls. They again used this cumulative head impact index. This is this retrospective index of what their total impact exposure has been. And they measured plasma tau. Right? So uh, they found an interesting dose response relationship between cumulative head impact index and the plasma tau measures in these former players. <laughs> 
So this is a study of fMRI by Talavaj et al. This is back in 2016. They did a test called the NBAC with fMRI. It's essentially a memory test, and the N means uh, how many previous sort of slides you can remember. One back would be, if you remember one slide back, two back would be two slides back. It gets progressively harder and harder. Um, and they found an association between performance on the NBAC with uh, head accelerations that they may, uh, measured in these players. They found that easier tasks produced activations similar to harder tasks. But what was interesting, when they looked at their fMRI patterns, this was preseason, they did pre and postseason imaging. So preseason, this is sort of the normal pattern they were observing. In their concussed subject, they showed all this decreased sort of fMRI activity, if you will, in the concussed participants. And then when they looked at their subconcussed participants, they had similar decrease in activity, even though there's no concussion that was experienced over the course of this study. So there's some evidence here that fMRI, where subconcussive impacts, something is changing inside the brain over the course of the season. Uh, this is a study by Bazarian et al. They did uh, diffusion tensor imaging. They looked at 10 college football players. They used the HIT system again, which are these helmet embedded sensors. We'll talk more about that a little later. And they had five non-athlete controls. Their measures included impact testing on the field as well as MRI with uh, diffusion tensor imaging. They did balance testing and they did some blood draws. Now this study is interesting because they had pre and postseason as well as a six month postseason follow up, which is hard to get in a lot of these studies. And then what they found with their, their football players had a greater change in what's known as fractional anisotropy, which is a measure of white matter integrity inside the brain and mean diffusivity from baseline at both the postseason scan and after six months of uh, rest following uh, the end of the season. And this is uh, from that paper where you can see this sort of change inside uh, uh, in FA that um, sort of goes, goes back, but not, doesn't quite get back to normal in the six month postseason uh, period. There have been a few studies looking at sex differences. This is one of those. This is by Salman et al. from 2018, where they looked at 25 college ice hockey players. 14 were male, 11 were female. There were no concussions inside this study group. Their measures, again, were impact testing, and they used MRI with diffusion tensor imaging, and they imaged both preseason and postseason. The way they did their analysis is something called track-based statistics, which essentially looks at the white matter skeleton. And they looked at the change in uh, these white matter measures like fractional anisotropy between uh, pre and post season for both the males and the females. And they found significant differences between the groups, between males and females in the in fractional uh, anisotropy in some specific white matter tracts, including what we call the superior longitudinal fasciculus, internal capsule, and coronal radiata. These are some large white matter tracts. But they didn't find any differences in impact scores or correlations with the, uh, the DTI with the impact scores. So this is uh, from that paper where they're looking at the differences here between males and females and change in these measures. And you can see that the females have more changes inside these specific air, these specific white matter tracts than the male counterparts. And this is also from that paper. These are preseason uh, on the left side, postseason on the right side. Males here, females here, not much difference there. But then when you go to the postseason, you can see that there's this large change for the uh, female athletes between pre and postseason for several of these metrics, whereas the male athletes were not showing this change. So it looks like, at least in this study, the female athletes are more sensitive to these effects of uh, sub subconcussive impacts. This is a very recent study, came out this year, where they looked at head impacts in the brainstem. And the reason they wanted to look at the brainstem, you know, these head impacts can really affect any part of the brain, but they were thinking here where the rotations are going to be maximized more towards the center of the brain and the brainstem, so they wanted to look specifically there. Uh, they looked at 38 college football players, uh, no concussions inside this group of players. They did, again, pre and post season MRI. They had the HIT system to measure these uh, impacts over the course of the season. And they looked specifically at the brainstem fractional anisotropy and the diffusion imaging. And the way they did that is they have this region of interest in the brainstem that they have on both the right side and the left side. And they compared their data to 29 concussed and 59 uh, control participants. So this was interesting because they found a change on the right side of the cortical spinal tract, not on the left side, but the right side was uh, associated with significantly reduced 
uh, fractional anisotropy, these measures of white matter integrity between pre and post season. And that there, this change in fractional anisotropy was associated with the rotational component of the impact exposure. Uh, when they looked at, that was for the subconcussive impacts. When they looked at their concussed subjects, they found a similar relationship in the right cortical spinal tract versus the controls. And for the concussed subjects, they also had blood draws and they sh saw, showed a relationship between blood tau, serum tau, and cortical spinal tract fra fractional anisotropy. Now, I'm not really sure why it's on the right side, but this is, this is, uh, this is their, uh, the data that they have. So there are some other uh, imaging techniques that we can use, something called spectroscopy, where we can uh, look at sort of metabolite concentrations in the brain. This is a study from 2014 by Poole et al, where they had 34 high school players. They had two teams, 10 controls, and they looked at pre and post season. And they wanted to look specifically in a specific area of their brain called the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And they're looking at motor uh, and motor areas inside the brain. And they're looking at sort of these spectroscopy metabolites. The spectrosco uh, spectroscopic imaging basically gives you these sort of graphs of metabolite concentrations in the brain. Uh, based on sort of the areas you're looking at. And what they found, there was an increase in the motor glutamate and glutamine uh, between post and preseason and decreases in total creatine on one of the, uh, for one of the teams. So that's an indication that there's spectroscopic changes uh, in the brain or metabolite changes associated with uh, subconcussive impacts. This is another study. Again, they're looking at spectroscopy. This is 40 male high school players, 23 female soccer players, and 27 controls. They had multiple imaging time points here. They had a preseason time point, two in-season time points, and two postseason time points. And they also did head impact monitoring, but they used something called the X-patch, which is basically a single sensor. It's usually placed on the neck that also measures uh, head, head accelerations. And um, they found, uh, they, they did single voxel spectroscopy, again, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and uh, motor cortex. And they found increases in glutamate concentration in the motor cortex and glutamine for the females, and decreases in dorsolateral prefrontal cortex glutamate for the males. And these were also related to high, what they considered to be high impact exposure or, or impacts above 50 Gs. And after a cessation of exposure, these, cha these uh, changes dissipated. And this is, again, from that, uh, from that paper where uh, you can see that there's, these stars are significant changes. This is the preseason time point. They see significant changes between the second in-season time point and the preseason, between the first and second in-season time point, and uh, then between the second in-season and the late postseason but then not between the pre and the late postseason. So it seems like these changes sort of dissipate with time. So uh, let's talk a little bit about measuring head impact exposure. So uh, we typically use uh, some, some type of accelerometers uh, to measure this. Accelerometers can give, give us measures of both linear and rota rotational acceleration. What we use is the HIT system, which stands for Head Impact Telemetry System. There are others in development. There are some mouth guard based systems that people are working on and probably going to be deployed uh, more widely uh, very soon uh, after more validation is done. This is what the HIT system looks like, and basically it's got these accelerometers that are embedded within the foam padding of the helmet. It doesn't affect the integrity of the helmet. Uh, these are proved uh, by the NCAA. Um, and there's a wireless um, base unit that sits uh, on the sideline acquiring the data from these accelerometers uh, wirelessly from each of the players. Uh, we acquire this, this type of data for every game and practice. It's not just during the games. So just so we have a sense of what uh, these sort of G levels are that we're measuring these uh, acceleration forces. So uh, an um, aggressive pillow fight between kids could be up to 15 Gs. Um, youth football game, anywhere from 20 to 100 Gs. A severe car crash, 150 uh, plus Gs. So um, this is uh, some video from some of our studies. So I thought I'd show some examples of what some of these impacts look like. This is an impact of a, between 20 and 30 Gs. Okay. So you can see that you know the impacts are not always helmet to helmet. So in this case, it's uh, helmet to, to ground. And a lot of these kids are more susceptible because their neck muscles aren't as well developed. 
terms of, you know, sort of protecting their heads. Okay, let's try that again. I'm trying to go to the next slide. Maybe this one. There we go. Okay. This is a uh, game impact of 30 to 40 Gs. Okay, again, I mean, uh, that looks like that's uh, helmet to, to ground. And this next one is a 50 plus impact during practice. One. Help him up, help him up. Okay, all right. Just in case you didn't see that. Help him up, help him up. All right, yeah, that was a pretty good shot. And so, so that's a subconcussive impact. There's no concussion that occurred, at least no clinically diagnosed concussion. And these sort of impacts are going on all the time at the, at the youth level. So our study um, is called uh, the eye tackle studies, uh, imaging, telemetry, and kinematic modeling. Um, so if you were thinking about uh, designing a study of uh, subconcussive impacts, you want, and you want it to be sort of rigorous, I mean, what would you want to have? You'd want to have some sort of head impact monitoring that goes on during all, imp during all practices and games. You want to do extensive sort of preseason and postseason testing as well. Some of the other things you might want to have is an athletic trainer on the field observing whether or not there's a, a concussion that occurs if you, you want to exclude the concussion participants. Something else you might want to have is um, videotape of all the games and practices because there are a lot of, you know, we're using these sensors to measure the impacts, but there are a lot of impacts that are not related to the game. It may just be that a kid takes off his helmet and throws it on the ground. You want to exclude those, right? So, I mean, there's a lot of moving parts to studies like this. And the other thing you want to have, especially if you want to get your study funded, is a good name. <laughs> so it took, it took a while to come up with this name. But anyway, so these are the eye tackle studies. So, um, yeah, at least between now and um, since we started these studies back in 2012, there have been over 300 athletes at this point instrumented between the ages of 9 to 18. We have a youth study in this as well as a high school study. And the study design is essentially what I just described. So we have these hit sensors embedded inside the helmets. At the time we started these studies, those were the best sensors that were available. Um, and, we, and we measure their impacts during all games and practices, athletic trainer on the field, checking to see whether or not there's a concussion. If there's a concussion suspected, then they go see a physician who does a formal evaluation. Preseason, we do extensive MRI, multimodal MRI, including everything you can throw at it, structural imaging, diffusion tensor imaging, susceptibility weighted imaging, perfusion imaging. What did I leave out? I left something out. Resting state fMRI. The one thing we don't do is spectroscopy, and that's because we try to fit the whole study into about 45 to 50 minutes. That's kind of the golden rule in MRI studies. You don't really want to go over an hour, and the spectroscopy would take at least another 10 or 15 minutes. And we do that pre and post season. We also do resting state MEG, so that's another component of this magnetoencephalography. And then we do extensive cognitive testing. So it's not just the impact testing, we also have um, um, NIH toolbox measures and a variety of other measures that we do pre and post season. And if there is a concussion that's observed, we also have a concussion protocol where we repeat the imaging and repeat the cognitive testing that's done uh, post concussion, uh, preferably between sort of one to five days. Um, and so this is just sort of a, another example of what that study design looks like. So this is a very rich data set, so we can look at it in a bunch of different ways since we have all these, um, you know, we're measuring all the impacts that they're experiencing over the course of the season, we can look at things like the impact magnitude. So what we see when we look at the youth level, which is sort of 8 to 13, uh, is uh, impact magnitudes at the youth level compared to the high school and college are similar in magnitude, but there are lower total number of impacts. And this is a reflection of sort of that data in terms of what their medium, median Gs are as well as their peak Gs. But the total number of impacts here per player is uh, less for the youth in the high school and college level. It's another way of plotting that data where we can sort of look at their cumulative distribution. Um, so the blue curve here is sort of high school athletes, the red is sort of the youth uh, athletes, and you can see these curves are very close to each other right, in terms of what their uh, 
uh, head impact exposures over the course of a season. And then we can break that down further, right? So we can look at um, things like head impact exposure during practice and head impact exposure during games. And when we do that for the youth, we see an interesting relationship here. Um, the um, light blue is their head impact exposure during practice. So we see that the majority of the head impact exposure for the youth players is occurring during the practices, not during the game. So that's an opportunity for reducing head impact exposure and specifically looking at what those, uh, the what's going on in practice. Um, in terms of the imaging, uh, I'll start out talking about with some of our diffusion tensor imaging studies or our diffusion studies. Um, and as I, we, we get a variety of metrics from the diffusion imaging data. These are all sort of measures of white matter integrity, so fractional anisotropy, mean diffusivity, and then some subcomponents sub of that. This particular study, we looked at 24 of the high school players. We had multiple DTI metrics that we computed. As I said, FA, mean diffusivity, linear, planar, spherical anisotropies. Um, and then to sort of analyze this data, um, we, at the time, we didn't really have a good control group yet. We were sort of acquiring that control group and building the control group. So what we did here was compared each individual to their preseason studies. There, so we had that, that sort of preseason scan. So we took sort of the group's uh, standard deviation and change in FA between postseason and preseason. And then um, we compared each individual uh, position and in the imaging data or each individual voxel to this group FA that's voxel-wise. And then we set a threshold, the Z threshold of greater than two standard deviations from the mean. And we also applied a little cluster threshold. So they had to, you know, these abnormalities sort of had to cluster together um, about one ml. And then um, we summed all the abnormal voxels together for each subject. So the reason we did that is because uh, traumatic brain injury can really be anywhere inside the brain, right? So. Uh, when you do sort of these studies, when you're looking at a group subjects, if the tr injury doesn't occur in the same place repeatedly, it's hard to get enough power to show that there's a change. So this way, we compute a single number uh, representative of their total number of abnormal voxels in the brain, right? So that way it gets rid of this idea of sort of spatial localization of where the injury is. And then we compare that, this single number that we get for um, each uh, subject to their cumulative head impact exposure over the course of the season that we acquire from the um, helmet embedded sensors. And when we do that, we see a nice linear relationship here between head impact exposure and change in their fractional anisotropy. Now, um, again, this is, there are no concussions inside this group. Um, it's a single season of football, and it's comparing their post to preseason. So there's a change inside the FA that we're seeing in these players that apparently have no symptoms, um, but changes inside their brain that we're seeing that are associated with what their head impact exposure is. And then when we look at some of the other sort of subcomponents of the, uh, of the diffusion tensor imaging, these other measures like linear anisotropy, planar, spherical, we also see significant changes in those. So it's not just FA that's showing this abnormality, but some of these others are also uh, very highly significant there. So another way we can do this uh, is to use something called track-based spatial statistics, which gets some uh, sense of where these abnormalities are occurring. So essentially what uh, TBSS does is it reduces these thick white matter pathways to sort of skeletons of white matter. And it's comparing sort of changes along the skeleton of the white matter between uh, different groups. So for this analysis, we looked at eight big hitters, 10 little hitters, uh, we call them big and little based on their cumulative head impact exposure. Um, and we did this two by TBSS analysis, uh, corrected for you know multiple comparisons we do for these things, and we looked at both within group and between group differences. So both groups demonstrated this main effect of time with global increases in FA, presumably representing uh, brain development that's going on. But we also saw that there was widely distributed significant areas of decreased FA between post and preseason and increased mean diffusivity for the heavy hitters compared to the light hitters. And what that looks like is this, or these scattered areas of increased um, of, of, of differences in change in FA between the, those two groups. And that's again over one season of high school football, uh, no concussions, um, so subconcussive, what would be considered subconcussive impacts.
So we can take that a little further. There are other ways to look at the DTI data, and we can look at specific tracks. We can generate these, you know, beautiful sort of tractograms, and we can look at specific areas in the brain. Um, here we use this technique called automatic, uh, automated fiber quantification. This is sort of tractography along the corpus callosum. We can also, you know, look at different areas along the corpus callosum and some of these large white matter tracks like the superior longitudinal fasciculus, inferior longitudinal fasciculus, et cetera. So for this study, we looked at 25 male youth uh, uh, football players. A again, these are ages 8 to 12. No concussion during the season. No history of neurologic disease. Pre and post season DTI impacts measures using the HIT system during all practices and games. And here we see this very interesting, significant relationship along these tracks. This is for the corpus callosum of uh, change in FA, AD, mean diffusivity, and some of these other metrics that's associated with their um, cumulative head impact exposure that we're measuring from these sensors. Again, these are asymptomatic kids, seem fine, but the imaging apparently is showing that there's a change between post and preseason. And then when we look at some of these other tracks, this is the inferior uh, frontal occipital uh, uh, fasciculus. It's one of these sort of white, large white matter tracks. Again, we see a similar relationship here. It was seen for a bunch of these tracks, superior longitudinal fasciculus as well as the corpus callosum. <coughs> So we went a little further. We said, well, why don't we take a look at the nerve terminals? Because, you know, apparently, you know, diffuse axonal injury should be occurring at, uh, characteristically at the terminals between the white matter and the gray matter. Let's see if we have a relationship there as well before I showed you what it was across the entire fiber bundle. And when we look at that, um, okay, I got to get rid of these. <laughs> That takes too long. So uh, again, we see this relationship at the nerve terminal, at the fiber terminals between head impact exposure and uh, these measures of fractional anisotropy um, for these uh, different uh, white matter tracks. So we also have fMRI data. So here we looked at changes in what we, what we call interhemispheric connectivity using fMRI or the bold effect blood oxygen level dependent resting state fMRI. And we separated these into heavy hitters and light hitters. For the fMRI, we used six minutes of resting state fMRI, the sort of standard processing methods. Um, but to look at interhemispheric connectivity, we've got an atlas, and on the atlas, there are regions of interest that are predefined, and we looked at the connectivity between right and left side for all these regions on our atlas. So this is sort of how we created that interhemispheric connectivity. We looked at the change in connectivity between postseason and preseason. And what we saw that there were significant changes in brain network con connections between the heavy hitters and light hitters over the single season in sort of these various areas, frontal inferior, triangularis, precentral gyrus, lingual gyrus, thalamus, cerebellum. So scattered areas where we're seeing significant changes in the brain network between these two groups of players. Again, these are all subconcussive impacts. So then we also applied uh, some machine learning techniques. We did, applied sort of standard support vector machine to see if we could predict who's a heavy hitter and who's a light hitter. So we trained an SVM here uh, on these uh, heavy hitters and light hitters. Um, you sort of just, you know, leave one out, uh, cross-validation, and uh, to estimate the statistical significance. So you did permutation testing uh, a thousand uh, times uh, with uh, permutation testing. Um, and here, we we're able to identify these specific areas or networks in the brain that are able to discriminate between who are the heavy hitters and who are the light hitters. So in this analysis, basically, we're just providing the um, algorithm, the fMRI data uh, between heavy hitters and light hitters, and it's able to tell us these were the heavy hitters, these were the light hitters. And this was sort of the classification accuracy we were able to get very high for the heavy hitters a little bit lower for the light hitters, but overall about 92% classification accuracy. So we have some other things that we can do with our DTI data. So when we set up our study, we didn't just do diffusion tensor imaging. We also did something else called diffusion kurtosis imaging. That essentially means we have 
uh, uh, one more, if you will, B value that we add that allows us to look at the non-Gaussian diffusion, so it opens up another um, additional areas of analysis of this data. So this kurtosis uh, sort of quantifies, as I said, the non-Gaussianity of the distribution, which is not specific to imaging. So you can think of it as larger kurtosis measures greater microstructural complexity. We can also get measures of axonal water fraction, which measures how much water there is in the axons to the total water signal, and this may be an indication of axonal swelling or beating. So it starts to get at sort of mechanisms of what might be going on by using some of these more advanced metrics. So here we had the 24 high school players. We computed the diffusion kurtosis metrics using sort of standard methods here, mean kurtosis is subcomponents including axonal water fraction. We used that same method I talked about before with the z-score mapping so we can reduce all the data to a single number for each of the subjects and then we can compare to risk-weighted exposure. And when we do that, we see this linear relationship between um, kurtosis and uh, cumulative impact exposure uh, for these players. This is the change in kurtosis between postseason and preseason. So that was a lot on sort of MRI data. So we also have a, a component where we're looking at magnetoencephalography. So MEG is a non-invasive form of functional brain imaging, detects very tiny magnetic fields inside the brain at the femtotesla scale created by neurons. So this is completely different. The mechanisms here are completely different than MRI. So, um, you know, you might say, well, you know, the DKI data is similar to the DTI data. Maybe you're seeing the same relationship. So in the MEG, the uh, mechanisms are completely different in terms of how we measure this, uh, this data. And here what we're specifically looking at are delta waves. So delta waves are slow waves. They're not normally present in teens or adults. And it turns out that injured brain tissue emits delta waves. And it's uh, been seen in military and civilians with TBI. These delta waves are in this low frequency range. These are, this is what sort of normal brain waves would look like. And these delta waves would be these sort of obvious sort of slower waves that, that occur following. It's really any sort of brain injury. Uh, even in neurodegenerative diseases, you can see delta waves. Um, but in this population, it's sort of specific because these kids and high school players, they don't really have any other things. You know, they don't have brain tumors. They don't have Alzheimer's disease. They don't have these other things. So they shouldn't really have these delta waves. So for our analysis, we acquire eight minutes of eyes open resting state MEG data, both pre and post season. This is sort of what the raw data looks like. It looks like sort of a glorified EEG. Um, but we were able to take that data and then, um, and then map it to brain space. And so here are some of the steps that we apply, sort of standard processing steps for MEG data. But in the end, we're, as I said, we're able to get the delta wave data down to brain space. And then we can measure things like what's the power of the delta wave spectrum for each subject. And then we can do a similar analysis as we did with the diffusion data. We can use z-score maps to quantify what's the total number of abnormal voxels in the brain using MEG and relate that to cumulative impact exposure. And we do it, and lo and behold, we have a similar relationship that we saw with the DTI data where there's this linear relationship between cumulative impact exposure and increase in delta waves between post and preseason for these players. So since we have sort of localization of delta waves, we can also look at the data a little bit differently. And the, hel the helmet embedded sensors are telling us where the impacts are occurring on the helmet during the, the season. So if we look at where the maximum impacts occur on the helmets and compare to that to where we see the delta wave activity, there's an interesting relationship that we've seen where these frontal impacts are resulting in delta waves posteriorly in the sort of occipital area. And then where there's these top of the head impacts are resulting in delta waves that we tend to see in the inferior frontal lobe. So uh, that is very suggestive of sort of a coup contra coup relationship between where the impacts are occurring, where the maximum impacts are occurring, and where we see the delta wave activity. Um, now, one of the reasons we're very excited about the MEG, unlike the MRI data where to really show the relationships between um, the, these uh, subjects, we have to have a lot of group data. MEG looks like it can actually show us this at the individual subject level. And this is sort of an example. This, uh, these are two subjects over the course of the season who had a very low number of impacts, a low risk-weighted exposure uh, using our sensors. 
And this is you know, how much delta wave activity change that we're seeing over the course of the season. Really not much for either of these two players. These are two different players, had lots of impacts, higher, or higher cumulative head impact exposure, and there's obvious increase in delta waves over the course of the season that we're seeing. And these are at the individual subject level. So it's really hard for MRI, at least up to this point, to be able to show us this at the individual subject level. Um, <clears throat> this is a study, uh, again, this is with MEG. This is 20 male football players, 16 to 18 years of age. These players did have a history of con concussion. So they had a previous history of concussion, but they did not have any concussions during the season. And they have no history of neurologic disease. So again, we do pre and post season MRI, MEG, helmet embedded sensors, athletic trainer on the field to identify concussion. And for this, we looked at something called the default mode, right? This is kind of our resting state network that's active, um, typically when you're not necessarily paying attention. So. <laughs> Sure, how many people's default modes are active at this time? But um, so we extract uh, this mean time series from these different characteristic areas of the default mode that are highlighted here, and then we compute the change in default mode connectivity over the season between pre and post season. What's the change in the connectivity of this default mode uh, that occurs over the course of the season? So when we look at that, we don't really see anything. And this is without any, co uh, without any co regressors. So, for these players, there's no change in the default mode. So, we added some co, co regressors to see well, what's the effect of some of these things. So, we look at age, really doesn't have an effect. Um, measure your time between scans. I don't know if BMI is here. But then, if we add in history of concussion, lo and behold, a very significant relationship emerges. So the previous history of concussion is affecting their default mode connectivity over the course of the season. Now, um, and this is another way of looking at data. So subjects with, pre, uh, this is the sort of, um, this uh, no previous concussion, previous concussion. So subjects with this previous history of concussion had significant lower correlations in default mode from preseason to postseason, whereas no differences were found for age, BMI, or head impact exposure. So it seems like a previous history of concussion is modulating the activity of the brain, experiencing impacts over the course of a season. And there's been other literature in the fMRI data showing this similar relationship in terms of default mode activity with previous history of concussion modulating the effects of uh, the default mode connectivity um, following mild traumatic brain injury. Uh, this is sort of a visual example of a player in their uh, delta wave activity that we map using MEG. This is their preseason delta waves. It's a 16-year-old. He plays defensive back for a far city football team. He took a couple hits to the head during the first half. Headache, trouble balancing, did SCAT 2, confirmed balance and memory de deficit. So this he had a concussion. And this is within uh, several days of the concussion. You can see this visually obvious sort of increase in delta wave activity between pre and post seasons. An, an example of why we're sort of excited about this, about MEG as a potential uh, way of looking at concussions and following um, the natural history of concussions. Now, I told you that um, delta wave activity is uh, not normal in teens and adults, but Kids can have delta wave activity. So delta wave activity is normal in children, but it decreases with age through adolescence. And that relationship has been shown with EEG studies. So we wanted to look at what's the MEG normal distribution in youth that's not really been looked at yet. So we have a lot of youth data already. So we basically plotted our youth and high school data here. Uh, and our baseline MEG uh, delta wave activity, and this is ages here from 10 to 18. There's a little gap here between the youth and the high school players. There's not quite perfect overlap there, but there's a nice relationship that's seen here where delta wave activity decreases as the kids mature. And that's sort of what we expected to see based on the EEG literature. But this looks very similar to another relationship that we know of in imaging, and that's for gray matter volume. So gray matter volume has a very similar relationship in that uh, as you, uh, through uh, adolescence, gray matter volume decreases, and that's believed to be due to, to pruning or getting rid of sort of, uh, sort of white matter or some gray matter that's not necessarily needed. Um, but these two relationships look very similar, right? So if we look at them together, again, we have a nice linear relationship between 
uh, delta wave activity and change in whole brain gray matter volume. So it may be that this change in, gray ma in um, delta wave activity that's occurring uh, through adolescence may be uh, just a response to the pruning process that's occurring through um, adolescence. And uh, we're just sort of speculating here, it may be that this gets altered with a history of, uh, with multiple uh, subconcussive impacts over the course of the season. So there was a little bit of talk about this, so I've got a slide on this as well. So you have to be careful of some of these translational models looking at diffuse external injury and behavioral change as models for, as human models. So this is a study in Sprague Dolly rats. They have an impact acceleration model, locomotor activity, rotor rod, anxiety maze. This is, their, this is essentially the cognitive equivalent of what we do in humans. And what they found was there's lots of diffuse external injury in response to this impact acceleration model, but no functional impairments in motor, sensor motor, cognitive neuropsych over one week. Right? So this on path, they can see these you know, obvious changes in response to their head impact uh, acceleration model, but no changes in what we consider these cognitive and motor um, uh, behavioral variables. So it's just uh, as was mentioned before, it's a grain of salt when you're trying to compare some of these uh, animal models to what goes on inside the human. So to sum things up, Youth football players are experiencing high magnitude impacts approaching those of high school and collegiate players. Most of these are occurring during practice for the youth players. Uh, there are relationships that we're finding between imaging changes and impact exposure over season of football in the absence of concussion and the long-term con consequences of these are uh, unknown. Now, we get a lot of questions on you know, why we're doing these studies. Just to make it clear, we're not trying to eliminate football, although I'm not sure if the audience here agrees with that. <laughs> At least that's what I say in the USA. Um, we're looking really to make football a safer activity for millions of children and teenagers. And what I must say, there's a lot of people that are involved in these studies. Uh, we start, I studied these studies when I was back at Wake Forest and I still collaborate uh, with, um, I have collaborators at Wake Forest, so we do this as a team. And we also have investigators at Children's uh, National in Washington and um, it's sort of a, a list of acknowledgments of the people involved. It's a really a large team is needed to acquire this sort of, sort of rich data, as you can imagine, with all these players and helmet changes and player and people on the field. So thank you. I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, Joe, that was a uh, tour de force uh, demonstration of what imaging can do, but I have an important question about one particular aspect of your presentation, which was related to safety. So you showed that in practice, these football players are potentially getting more brain injury than they are in the games. There are no medical staff present during practices, is that right? Um, or are there staff routinely present at medical practices? Because if they're not, then do we need to use your helmet sensors to determine what threshold of injury they have to keep them from continuing to practice and play until they recover? So some of it depends on the league that they're in, whether or not the athletic trainer has to be there. At the youth level, it's very loose. For our studies, we always have an athletic trainer there present at the practices and at the games specifically. Well, we're actually looking for concussions here, but yeah, I think it'd be a good idea to have some sort of professional there at all these games and practices. 